Thank you for joining us for our Parent Lunch and Learn program. Today we are joined by Tiffany and Ashley, library staff members, um, for a special program on the science of well-being for parents and addressing that parent and caregiver burnout. So I'll turn it over to you all. Thank you so much for being here or for watching this later. Well, thank you for having us. My name is Tiffany. I'm an adult services librarian. I work in our Founders Hall location in Uptown. Um, I have a passion for wellness programming and I'm excited to be here and share with you some of uh, this great information today. Yes, thank you for having us. Uh, I'm Ashley. I am also an adult services librarian in the Steel Creek Library location. And yes, also have a passion for this topic for mental health and well-being. Um, my undergraduate is actually in psychology. So I've always been interested and I'm always happy to throw in some of those psychological principles into my, my daily job today. So, and now. Okay, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, so our goal for this class, as you can see, we have our objectives here on the screen. Um, our goal for this class is to talk with you guys a little bit about what burnout is and the different ways that it can show up in your life. We're going to look at the consequences or symptoms of experiencing it. And then we're going to take a look at the various areas of our lives and how burnout can affect them. And relatedly, we're also going to learn about some healthy habits that you can incorporate into your life that will support you in your overall wellness journey. So our goal for you to, um, by the end of this program, we hope, we're hoping that you're going to be able to identify the five main areas of your life and what those look like. Um, we're hoping that you're going to have some tools in your toolbox to efficiently manage, uh, officially, officially, efficiently rather <laughs> manage your stress. And then we're hoping that we're going to be able to help you set yourself up for success by recognizing triggers and potentially problematic situations, people, or circumstances. You said Ashley for the next yes, one? Yes, okay. absolutely. So I have the task ask of defining burnout here. What exactly is it? Well, I have the official definition right underneath my heading here. It is a state of chronic stress. And the key word there is chronic. So we all have stressors from time to time, but it's when those stressors continue for long periods of time and turn into that chronic state is when we're really susceptible to burnout. And burnout isn't just something you wake up one day and say, oh, I'm burnt out. It's much more insidious than that. It sneaks up on you. Um, so, and this is why we're here today to make sure that it doesn't sneak up on you or when it does, you're aware and you have strategies to handle it. Um, so when that stress turns to chronic, turns to burnout, it can lead to three certain things. And those three things are really the telltale signs of burnout. So one is physical and emotional exhaustion. And that is things like chronic fatigue, uh, insomnia and impaired concentration. The second symptom is cynicism and detachment. Those are things like pessimism, isolation, and loss of enjoyment in things that usually give you joy. And finally, the other symptom of burnout is just feelings of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishments. So what does that look like? On a day-to-day -day basis, that looks like apathy, uh, increased irritability, and just a general lack of productivity. So all three of these things can take root. You could have more of one than the other, maybe more apathy, but you sleep fine. Maybe the sleep is really not there and there's some insomnia, but you still get joy out of certain things in your life. So burnout can look different for every different situation. It's very unique. Um, and you can see how these symptoms can kind of affect all the areas of your life. Um, isolation can really affect your social connections, which we know make us happy. We'll talk about that later. Um, insomnia and lack of sleep could really affect um, our exercise routine and um, our physical activity. So that's why, yeah, burnout, it's not so great, um, but hopefully we'll have some tips here to kind of show you how to avoid these types of uh, symptoms. And again, burnout doesn't just go away after a day or two. Um, it's, it's a lifestyle. So unless you make some changes, it's not going to, you know, it'll likely stay with you. Okay, so part of what we're here to talk about today is the science of well-being and also to hopefully better understand our own individual wellness. 
Uh, and in order to do that, we need to understand the differences between or the difference between wellness and well-being. So wellness is defined as a state specifically related to our overall emotional and physical health. And it's also known as one's purposeful pursuit to maintain or acquire it. It's basically the quality or st quality or state of being healthy. So wellness is the purposeful, intentional pursuit of attaining your health, whereas well-being is associated with one's overall happiness, uh, taking into consideration the different areas of life that together paint a holistic picture of what makes us happy. So well-being is related to the feelings that come from your wellness efforts. So on the screen, you can see we've listed the five areas of your life that together create that holistic picture. So you might think, well, why are these important? Well, again, these areas are responsible for our overall experience in our lives, and each is interdependent in some way on the others. So ideally, there'll be a natural ebb and flow with each of these. So some days you're going to be stronger or more efficient in one over another, and others other days that's going to change. The important thing to note is that we need to be aware of these intimately. In essence, it's like laying all of your cards on the table and asking yourself, you know, what does my spiritual life look like? What about my physical health? What about my financial health? Um, studies have shown that people with strong faith, regardless of what your specific belief system is, uh, these people tend to be more successful and they manage life stresses more efficiently. In addition, you know, think about, Ashley gave us some examples before, but if you think about your emotional well-being, you know, if you're struggling, how easily that could impact your, your social well-being or how your physical health could impede your relationships or it might keep you from working and then have an impact on your financial health. So each one of these areas is really important to be aware of. So like Tiffany mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of what we're talking today is based off of the science of well-being. Um, and the science of well-being is an online course uh, on Coursera.org. It is totally free and it is taught by a Yale professor, uh, Dr. Lori Santos. So she created this course for her Yale students and uh, it was so popular that she wanted to make it accessible to the masses. Um, hence how, why she created the course, she kind of recorded those lessons and made it available to us uh, through Coursera.org. And we've actually created a learning circle around this course where we meet um, weekly for about 10 weeks and discuss the material and put these practices um, into making them habits and into our daily life. And one of the main things that Dr. Lori Santos talks about in her course is rewirements. So what is a rewirement? It is a healthy practice aimed at rewiring your habits to boost happiness. And on the right hand side of the slide, I've listed those rewirements that she discusses, signature strengths, savoring, gratitude, kindness, et cetera. And uh, we'll go through all of those as well. Um, but the great thing about these rewirements is that they're practices that we can start right away. We can try to express gratitude on a daily basis through a journal, or we can get that extra amount of sleep by going to bed an hour earlier, creating a, a sleep routine at night. So I mentioned in my slide that burnout, it, it doesn't go away unless you make some changes. These are the changes that we think um, could really, that Dr. Larry Santos and science um, says that could really boost your happiness and therefore decrease your stress and decrease the likelihood of being burnt out. So yeah, it's just all about managing stress. Uh, it's not about eliminating stress because like I said, also we're always gonna have stressors. These are just great ways to manage that stress so that it doesn't turn to chronic and that it doesn't turn into burnout. Okay, so we're going to dive into this first rewirement, and I will just add on that Ashley and I have taught this uh, science of well-being course a, a few times um, over the past couple of years, and we've seen it have a really positive impact, not only on ourselves, but on the uh, on the customers who attend these classes with us. So these are real actionable things that you can do that can have an impact on, on your life. Um, so we're going to jump right into this first rewirement, which is signature strengths. So signature strengths are actually um, part of your character strengths. And you might think, well, what are those? <laughs> well, your character strengths are the positive parts of your personality that impact the way you think, 
feel and behave. So in our course, Science of Wellbeing on Coursera, there is a survey you can take, um, which uh, we're happy to share with you uh, via email after this course, if you're interested. Um, and it asks you a series of questions and it's gonna return 20 to 25 character strengths, which are those positive parts of your personality. It's gonna be things like leadership skills, social intelligence, humility, honesty, uh, spirituality, teamwork. They're all kind of listed for you here on the screen too, if you're able to see those. So within that list, the top five are what are considered your signature strengths. And they're super important to know. Keep in mind that all of these character strengths are positive. So nothing on that list is bad. It just shows you what your where your strengths really lie. So you might think, well, why are these important to know? Well, probably the most important thing I would say is because it gives you insight into yourself. It really promotes self-awareness. And that kind of self-awareness is really key in helping you navigate the world in the most efficient way by shedding light on how you view the world and also how you see yourself fitting in it. So um, how can knowing your signature, strength, signature strengths rather help you with burnout? Well, for example, choosing a career that allows you to tap into your natural strengths can increase your happiness on the job. Your work efforts are more natural, and because you're using your strengths, you're, an, you're excelling in a very organic way. If you think about a job that you can do, but it doesn't require you to use your natural talents, you might be good at it, but you might not enjoy it. And then you think about a job where you are using your natural talents, and it doesn't mean it's not work, but it's something you likely will enjoy a lot more. And when we feel confident in what it is that we're doing, that can really alleviate our feelings of ineffectiveness. Um, the uh, signature strengths can also act as a window in how we manage our relationships, whether those are our romantic relationships, friendships, professional relationships, relationships with members of our family. Um, they can definitely help with that. And then lastly, it's really beneficial to know, I think, on your list what you score the least on. It can be just as enlightening because it can give you a focus if you're interested in doing any self-improvement work. It can give you some areas where you may want to take a take a second look at. I just want to add that that's such a great point, Tiffany. And when I took this uh, test, gratitude was actually one of my lower strengths. So I really made it um, a point to kind of practice that more and mm -hmm. kind of, yeah, make it a little higher on that list. So, yeah, it's a good yeah. zoning. And they're all good. There's nothing bad on the list. So, I mean, it's really anything. It just gives you some 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 good insight into yourself, I think, at least minded. And it can change because I um, have taken this test several times over the last couple of years. And my my top 10 have stayed the same, but they've changed order. But my my bottom five have not changed. So I, to, I guess I need to take my own advice and work on that a little bit. Okay, so we're going to jump into our second uh, rewirement, which is probably my favorite one, which is savoring. Um, the definition of savoring is the use of thoughts and actions to increase the intensity, duration, and appreciation of positive experiences and emotions. So why is savoring important? Well, it helps us to be in the moment, to be fully present. And this is helpful because a lot of us, I can speak for myself for sure, live in the past or are off somewhere in the future when our point of power is actually now. So how does savoring help us manage or avoid burnout? Well, savoring is about being present. It's about being grounded in that moment and observing what is actively around you and what you're actively feeling. You know, one thing that can lead to burnout is ruminating about events that have happened or things that could potentially happen. And we have no control over the past or the future because, again, our moment of power is now. Um, so being intentional with being present and paying attention to what's going on around us, like the smell of the air or hearing birds sing or a child laughing, that allows us to be immersed in an active experience. And it really is a form of meditation, in my opinion. So this can serve us in two ways. Um, you can't you can't spend or you can't be actively in your brain thinking about negative thoughts or problems if you're savoring something positive, like the examples that we just um, we just listed. So it keeps you in a positive space. 
And the other benefit of practicing savoring is that we train ourselves to seek out the positive. And when you do that, you naturally begin to see more positive things. So there's a really great quote that I like that says, if you look for obstacles, you'll find, op you'll find problems. And if you look for opportunities, you'll find solutions. So it's really about perspective. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, though, related specifically to savoring is it's really effective in helping to manage negative thinking. Um, we've all been there. You've had a bad thought or you had a bad experience and you're thinking about it and you're going, you're chewing on it and you're turning over. It's turning over and over in your mind. And next thing you know, you're down the rabbit hole. And it's a type of obsessive thinking that can have real consequences for us, especially if we worry because worry, you know, it just, it just sticks with us. Studies have shown that athletes, when they are thinking about their sport, their brain doesn't know the difference between when they're sitting in a chair, just thinking about it versus out on a track running or jumping or whatever their sport is. So if you're having bad thoughts, it's real to your brain especially if it's trauma, it's like reliving it over and over again. So I mentioned this because savoring is a really excellent tool to have in your toolbox that can help you break those spiral, those spiraled thoughts. Um, the first thing I will say is be easy on yourself because catching yourself in these spirals, I know for me, sometimes I've been down that rabbit hole more than a minute by the time I realize, wow, I'm down the rabbit hole, rabbit hole. And that's okay. Just kind of be easy on yourself about that, because once you start to practice, hey, I recognize I'm doing this, and then you start to implement some of these um, strategies that we give you, uh, you will it will be a lot faster that you'll start to recognize those types of spiral thoughts. So um, there's one in particular, one exercise I wanted to share called the five, four, three, two, one. So if you catch yourself in spiral thinking and you know, okay, I'm at the bottom of the rabbit hole, I need to try to get myself out of here. The five, four, three, two, one technique is really good. So what you do is you start with five things you can see. And I like to say it out loud, depending on how intense the spiral is. I like to say, okay, I see my ring. I see this pin in front of me. And I literally just focus on five things that are around me. And then the second one is you look for four things you can feel. I think I can feel my my sweater on my skin. I can feel the breeze on my face. Just those four things. Say them out loud again because it helps. There's something about saying it and thinking it at the same time that is more impactful, I think. Um, so it's five things you can see, four things you can feel, three things you hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. Um, and the reason this exercise is so beneficial is because you can't continue to focus on your negative thoughts when you are purposeful in your thinking in this way. And especially when you try to frame those five, four, three, two, one things about something positive, if you can do that. So the next rewirements that we're going to talk about is gratitude, which is timely because Thanksgiving is coming up. And I know that we usually like to, at least you, you said you were from Australia, um, here in America, I'm not sure how long you've been in America, um, but we usually like to, on Thanksgiving, go around the table and say one thing we're grateful for. But the point here uh, from what we learned in this class in Science of Wellbeing is that gratitude is much more than just saying one thing um, at a dinner table once a year. It really is beneficial to include in, in your daily life. So the definition of gratitude is feeling and expressing a deep sense of thankfulness in life. Um, and like Tiffany was kind of touching on with savoring, it's very hard hard to stay in negative thoughts, um, pessimistic thoughts, if you're constantly or if you're returning to a state of thankfulness. And I like to kind of, when I talk about gratitude, I like to talk about the gratitude waterfall, which I think kind of leads to more gratitude and more happiness and therefore less stress and less burnout. So when you notice more things to be grateful for on a daily basis, then you start to think about more things to be grateful for because you're noticing them more. 
And when you think about those things more, then you start to feel better, very much like what we were saying with savoring. When you're thinking those positive thoughts, you feel better. And when you feel better, you're going to do more things to keep you feeling better. You'll be energized to exercise, um, go out to that dinner with your friends and um, other things that make you feel good. Um, And then the more you do those things, then the more you're going to notice to be grateful for. So again, it's maybe not a waterfall. Maybe it's just like a circle, like a circular cycle, which actually goes well with the picture on the side there, the I'm grateful for circle. So I'll share with you another quote that Tiffany and I really like. Um, It is by Wayne Dyer. He says, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And I think that really um, presents gratitude well. Um, It really is about how you look at things in your life, what you look at, as opposed to what you, you know, am I going to focus on one thing that's maybe negative, or am I going to be grateful for a thing like running water in my apartment? It's all about, again, perspective. Um, And this practice can really help with the cynicism and detachment that very often accompanies burnout. So if you are thankful and grateful on a regular basis, then it's going to be hard to remain detached from those things you're thankful for. So again, you'll see how that kind of combats that. And uh, there are so many ways to practice gratitude. Again, I gratitude was on the lower of my signature strengths, so I really had to work to make it a habit. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a uh, gratitude journal every morning or evening, three things written down on a sheet of paper. Um, you could say it aloud like the uh, 54321 strategy, uh, you could do a gratitude letter or visit. And those things are particularly powerful. So you could tell someone in your life how grateful you are for them by writing them a letter and then reading it to them or even visiting them with that letter and kind of expressing those feelings. And science has shown that that not only increases your happiness in the moment and the happiness of the person you're expressing your gratitude towards, but it actually increases your happiness for months afterwards because it's a powerful experience. Um, And happiness levels stay elevated even three months after a gratitude visit. So that's also a really great way to express gratitude or even make it fun and social like with your kid or your husband or partner. If you do something called a gratitude countdown, which I really like, which is where you kind of just say, okay, gratitude countdown. And then you each say five things that you're grateful for right then and there. And you take turns until you guys both reach um, five things to be grateful for. So it kind of, you can make it your own in terms of how you practice gratitude, how you incorporate it into your daily life. But it is, um, it's an excellent happiness booster. I love the gratitude countdown as something that a family could practice together. I think that's something that would have immediate benefit and it also would create a strong habit, especially in children, um, something positive for them to grow into it as they, you know, become adults. So I love that. Let's see. Okay. So our next rewirement is kindness. And I love this one too. So kindness is defined as the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate or thoughtful. But kindness really means so much more than just being nice. Kindness can mean different things to different people. Uh, The meaning really is in how you choose to show it. It could be empathy. It could be acceptance. It could be kind gestures or thoughtfulness. It may mean doing nice things without expecting nice things in return. And kindness can be as simple as just being grace. It could just be grace. So why is kindness important? Well, Kindness at its core is about who we choose to interact with the world, excuse me, rather how we choose to interact with the world and those around us. It's about intent. You know, you can walk through your day grumpy or even just kind of neutral, having a bad attitude, and you might have little to no impact on others. Uh, Or worse, if you are grumpy, you could have a negative impact on others. But when we uh, practice that outward kindness, we take the focus off of ourselves and put it on another whether that's a person, an animal, uh, or a place that's shared by multiple people, like a park or something in the environment. Um, When we practice kindness, we're choosing to be purposeful with our choices and actions uh, in a way that takes into consideration the impact that those choices and actions have on others. So kindness is a way of saying, I see you and you matter, and I respect and value the space that you occupy in the world. 
So how does kindness help us manage or avoid burnout? Well, the Mayo Clinic says specifically that kindness has been shown to increase self-esteem, empathy, and compassion, and it improves mood. It can decrease blood pressure and cortisol, which is a stress hormone that directly impacts our stress levels. So all in all, people who give of themselves in a balanced way, they tend to be healthier and they tend to live longer. There was one quote that I always remember that Tiffany said the last time we did this learning circle. I forget who it was, but when I say it, you may know Tiffany. Okay. The woman said, if you're having a bad day, fine, but don't be messing up somebody else's day oh, because of it. <laughs> Tabitha, Tabitha Brown. Yeah. She yes. says, but don't you dare go messing up anybody else's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That stuck with me. I just yeah. remembered it. All right. So the next requirement we're going to talk about is sleep, which when you think of burnout, sleep or lack of sleep is probably the first thing you think of. Um, but we're going to go, we're going to take a deeper dive into sleep and what it can do for your happiness and avoiding burnout in general. So the definition of sleep is on the slide there. Condition of body and mind recurs several hours every night. The nervous system is relatively inactive. The eyes are closed, muscles are relaxed, and consciousness practically is suspended. So the thing, obviously, that sleep can help with in terms of burnout is a physical and emotional exhaustion that accompanies burnout. So one of those telltale foundations of physical and emotional exhaustion was chronic fatigue. So, of course, getting not a certain amount of sleep, not the amount of sleep, but the quality of sleep is really going to help with that. And I argue that it also could help with feelings of ineffectiveness, which is also a sign of burnout because because one of those foundational things of feelings of ineffectiveness was an increased irritability. And I don't know about you, but when I don't get the sleep I need, I'm definitely more irritable and susceptible to whims of emotions and going down rabbit holes. So sleep is really important. And I also mentioned that I was a psych major, so I'm going to have to bring up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you guys are familiar with that pyramid structure that starts with foundational stuff and goes all the way up to self-actualization. And the whole premise of that pyramid is we can't go up to finally reach self-actualization without meeting those um, lower levels first. And Maslow puts sleep as one of the foundational things at the very, very bottom, right next to food, shelter, and safety. So what we hope to convey here is that we should all be treating sleep like a foundational need, um, as important as the food and the water that we drink that sustains us. So I mentioned before that it's not just about getting that eight hours of sleep every night. That time could look different for you and your body. It doesn't have to be eight hours, but it's the quality of sleep that I think is really um, make or break when it comes to sleep and making it work for you. So there are lots of things that you can do to make sure that you're getting quality sleep. I know right now smartwatches kind of track our um, waves of sleep and we do sleep in cycles of 90 minutes. So we kind of start to dive into sleep, reach the like levels of certain REM and then come back out and reach down to REM again. So we do sleep in cycles. So making sure that you're not waking up in the middle of one of those cycles when you're at your deepest REM is going to be great um, for feeling wakefulness and rested when you do wake. So smartwatches can really help with that in terms of tracking when you're waking up, how much um, REM sleep you're getting. But you don't need technology, of course, to know that you're getting quality sleep. Obviously, how you feel in your waking hours is um, a good gauge of your sleep quality. And Making a sleep routine uh, could really help with that quality. So that could look like things like no screen time an hour to two hours before bed, um, being mindful of when you're eating. So not eating past six or seven, so you're not sleeping on a full stomach. Um, lots of other things. Understanding your best sleep conditions as well. So if you know that you can't sleep in 72 degrees because that's too hot, then turning that thermostat down to say 68 degrees, if you know that's your perfect sleep temperature, those types of conditions. The lighting in your room could be a certain way to help you reach um, your pinnacle sleep there. And also anticipating what could be disruptions and trying to minimize those disruptions for those hours that you are getting sleep. So if you know that you've got to 
text string with your family that will go off all night, maybe silencing that string or silencing your phone so it's not waking you up or disturbing you. Or if you know you have a pet who may wake you up, then making sure that you're going for the walk, feeding them and everything so that they're good before bed. Um, but again, it's hard to do all of that. None of us are perfect and none of us are going to get our perfect sleep every night, but it's all about, you know, making that effort and just treating sleep with the importance that, that it really has on our body and our minds. So the next rewirement that I'm going to talk about is meditation. So the definition of meditation is to engage in mental exercise, such as concentration on one's breathing or repetition of a mantra for the purpose of reaching a heightened level of consciousness. So I could argue that that could help with burnout in terms of the physical and emotional exhaustion. So when you are forever on the go, sometimes you don't know that you're ready to drop. So meditation is kind of permission to stop and physically check in with how you're doing, um, which is a good way to avoid burnout. I also said earlier, burnout's pretty insidious and it can creep up, up on you. Meditation is a way to be able to kind of rein it back in and uh, see where you are, see where you're at. And it doesn't have to look like the gentleman in this picture sitting on a mat, very meditative with his palms up. Meditation, like gratitude, also can be a very personal practice. And whatever works best for you, even in that definition, if repeating a mantra works best or if just counting your breaths works best, um, it's totally your practice. The whole point is to just give it a try and see um, how it works. So one minute a day can truly help. Um, and there are lots of types of meditations. There are walking meditations. You could meditate while doing the dishes, which is really just kind of using your senses and your full um, experience to kind of just note the smell of the soap just while you're doing everyday tasks. It's again, it's about presence. And we get asked a lot, what is the difference between savoring and meditation? Because they are quite similar. And Tiffany, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think what we've kind of landed on is savoring is kind of using your senses and savoring something positive, like the taste of the food you're eating or a happy memory. Meditation is using those same senses no matter what. So you could have chaos all around you, but meditation is kind of bringing it back to your own breath and calming your body despite what's going on around you you. Um, if it's complete calm around you while you're meditating, great. Um, but it's not always going to look like that. And that's okay. It's just like I said about being present and it helps us pull us out of our chaotic thoughts. Um, and then we return to our chaotic thoughts because we're human. And then we stop them again. That's the practice of meditation. No matter how many times you return to the thoughts, noting them and bringing it back to the breath is what the goal of meditation is. So I think that's about it, right? Those are the requirements that we're really going to highlight. Um, there are some more requirements. Uh, we talked a bit about gratitude visits on the gratitude slide and, of course, social connection and exercise. Um, but, yeah, I think we've touched on it. And if you're currently on a wellness journey um, and you're curious about these types of things, Tiffany and I do provide a number of wellness programs. And I think, do you have any starting up, Tiffany, or any you'd like to share? Um, I think we're going to be doing the science of well-being after the first of the year. We haven't nailed down the dates yet, but if you're interested in um, being notified, we're happy to keep your email address and put that on a list and we'll let you know as soon as it comes, as soon as it's in Biblio events. So. I'm actually just wrapping up science of well-being. Today is our last meeting, but we do like to, you know, offer it numerous times. So I'm sure it will yeah, start up again. And I think we're also probably in the spring going to be offering foundations of mindfulness, which will be sort of um, there's uh, foundations of mindfulness one and two, uh, and it will be looking specifically at meditation. So. And we've also put together book lists. Um, those are the links there for further reading happiness 101 and explore the concept of happiness. Tiffany and I created those and they're just books on these topics um, specifically the books that Dr. Lori Santos also mentions in her Science of Wellbeing program. So 
Well, awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing that information with us. We'll make sure when this gets posted, too, that we include those book lists and other resources that you shared. So thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm going to...